Okay, so, well, good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us on this cold and damp November night for the latest in our series of webinars. My name is Bill Lambert, and I'm the Health, Welfare and Breeder Services Executive for the Kennel Club. I'm joined tonight by Mr. Benjamin Blacklock, who is one of the leading eye panellists for the Kennel Club BVA ISDS eye scheme. The Kennel Club's developed its health webinar series so we can all hear from experts in the field and discuss important health conditions in dogs. We want to share, learn, discuss and debate, including where feasible, share real life experiences. That said, please be aware we're not able to offer, we're able to offer you individual veterinary advice. So please do make sure you're registered with your local vet for this. And please do always visit a vet with any concerns you have about your dog. All our webinars are now available on the Kennel Club's YouTube channel. So please go and take a regular look at these and we'll continue to add content to these on different topics as they develop. Please do be aware you'll not, not, you won't be able to speak during the webinar, so please do not raise your hand. We will be welcoming questions at the end of the webinar. We've already received lots of pre-submitted questions, but if you have joined on the Teams app, you can use the Q&A feature to ask any new questions you may have, and we'll try and answer as many of these as we can at the end. So without any further ado, it gives me great pleasure to in, invite tonight's speaker, veterinary ophthalmologist, Mr. Benjamin Blacklock. Over to you, Ben. Thanks, Bill. Uh, really pleased to be here tonight talking to you all about the um, hereditary eye disease screening uh, that we offer. So it's going to be a real sort of whistle stop tour through uh, the history of the scheme and then the diseases we look for um, this evening. So uh, I, I hope it's uh, I hope everyone um, keeps up and uh, I'll try and get done in about 45 minutes to an hour and then hopefully um, have a few minutes for questions. So I'm um, my name is Ben, Ben Blacklock. I work up at the University of Edinburgh where we do a bit of eye testing. And then I, I also do um, eye clinics predominantly around um, north of England and um, sort of uh, central belt of Scotland. And I've been on the um, I've been a member of the eye panel uh, since about um, for about six years, I think. And then I've been a member of the eye panel working party, this group of us that sort of directs the, uh, the sort of future direction of the eye panel for a couple of years now. Um, so let's let, <clears throat> let's get started. Um, this is the rough overview of the contents for this evening and um, let's uh, let's just go straight into it. So a, a quick look at the history and organisation um, initially. So the eye scheme was first devised back in the 1960s and so it's been running a long time and it's a joint initiative between um, the BVA, so that's the British Veterinary Association, uh, the Kennel Club and the International Sheepdog Society. There are currently 32 members of the eye panel and that map there on the screen shows the location of everyone. Um, so, some centres only uh, have a single panelist and some centres have many panelists. So there's not 32 dots there, but 32 panelists around the UK. And we're reasonably well distributed. There's some big gaps. Wales is a, is a, is a large uh, area with lack of panelists and obviously some areas of Scotland and perhaps um, Southwest England as well. But you can see there's also some eye panelists in Ireland as well. Um, most panelists are prepared to travel. So, it, it, you know, if you have a, uh, uh, a local session in, in, say, South Wales, for example, then usually you can request that an eye panelist comes along to a, uh, a dog show or, a, or a, a testing session. And so by moving around, we can usually cover most of the United Kingdom. How do you get to be an eye panelist? Well, um, the existing panel is a, a combination of uh, experienced ophthalmologists from all sorts of backgrounds. Uh, going forwards, the new any new panelists must be either an experienced certificate holder or a specialist in veterinary ophthalmology. So um, any panelist that you see is going to have significant experience of examining eyes. It's, it's pretty much going to be all they do all day, every day. And then whatever your level of, of qualification wanting to join the panel, you still need to observe a number of tests with an existing panelist to make sure you know what you're doing. And then you need to sit in a, an additional exam as well. Appointments for the eye testing are made directly with the panelists. So there's no need to um, have a referral like, like you might require to see the veterinary ophthalmologist normally um, you can make uh, appointments directly with the centres and all the contact details for the panellists are, are on the BVA website. What are the requirements for you to have a, uh, your pet undergoing an ice cream? Well the dog must be microchipped. 
Um, and then if you are either Kennel Club or International Sheepdog Society registered, you must bring the owner registration certificate as well. And for the for the Kennel Club, that's the little A5, uh, usually green, sometimes purple if you're an assured breeder certificate. But importantly, it's not the three or five generation pedigree that um, people often um, bring along by mistake. If you've bred the dog yourself, then that kind of trifold registration document you get once you've registered the puppies, that is OK. So if you've not exchanged that for your owner registration certificate, we usually accept that. And I'll just um, I'll just start off here by saying that uh, the International Sheepdog Society, we don't see um, a as many uh, ISDS registered dog as Kennel Club registered dog. So if I ever today say Kennel Club and, and forget to say ISDS, I'm, I'm sorry. I probably see it only a handful of ISDS dogs every year, but they're obviously an important partner in this. So apologies in advance if I uh, abbreviate uh, the scheme to the Kennel Club scheme. So, so that's a little bit of history. What about the eye exam itself? And, and a, a big question people often ask is what eye, eye examination screening do I need? So let's have a look at the test. Firstly, the litter screen. This isn't uh, particularly common. We don't get that many litters presenting for litter screens. I, I wish we had more. Uh, this is the list of diseases that's published by the, the scheme um, of things that we pick up in litters of puppies. So there's 17 breeds there. And uh, as we go through this evening, I'm going to go through all these diseases listed, listed alongside those breeds. So hopefully by the end of the night, you'll know what all those are. But what do we actually do with the litter screen? So the puppies need to be between five and 12 weeks old. It's really important that they're, that they're young. So this is typically done with the breeders before rehoming. Now for the litter screen, the kennel club papers often haven't arrived and that's okay for the litter screen. So for the adult dogs, we really need that kennel club paperwork. We're a bit more um, lenient when it comes to the, the litters, but they must be microchipped. So, you know, microchipping five week old puppies can be, can be challenging, especially in smaller breeds. So some people um, choose to leave it till they're a little bit older. When we see a litter, one of the first things we'll do is we'll apply uh, special eye drops to each puppy. And these eye drops are, are usually a, a drug called tropicamide, and they're going to dilate the pupil so we can really examine the inside of the eye. And tropicamide takes between 10 and 30 minutes to kick in. It depends a bit on the eye and how much goes in and how much they blink and things like that. But by 30 minutes, all, all animals have a pretty dilated pupil. And often by 10 minutes, we've, we've had a good effect. So we'll sometimes come out and check them, think they're not quite ready, give them a bit longer. Then each puppy is examined with a variety of instruments to examine the front and the back of the eye. And I'm, I'm not going to go into a great detail about how we do that, but there are videos on the BVA website of, um, of, of the eye exam in progress if you want to see exactly what's done. Then this is the certificate that you get if you present your animals for a litter screen. So if you bring along literate puppies, uh, we'll fill in one certificate for the whole litter. So you can see here we've got um, space for 12 uh, puppies, which, which obviously uh, covers almost all litters and we uh, write the diseases that we're screening them for in these boxes here and then we tick whether they're affected or unaffected. Then there's some space down here for comments and, and hopefully we can tick this box here to say that no puppies are affected. The top section is just your details and the details of the sire and the dam and then this is where the eye panelist signs it at the bottom. So that's the eye, that's the eye certificate for the litter screening. Then probably the most common test we do is what's often just called the routine eye test. This is what I'll spend the majority of my uh, time when I'm eye testing doing. And this is a list of diseases that if, if any of you are, uh, are experienced breeders and have been around for a while, then this list of diseases used to be called Schedule A. It's now, it's now known as the list formerly known as Schedule A in a slight long mouthful. So the Kennel Club tend to refer to this as the KIOD list and KIOD being an acronym uh, standing for known inherited ocular disease. So how the scheme works in the UK is we have these 65 breeds listed here where we know that uh, various diseases are hereditary or inherited in those particular breeds. So if you um, look at this document, it's available online. Uh, if you look at this document and look up the breed of animal that breed of dog that you have, you can then see what is 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 known beyond reasonable doubt uh, that is an, in, an inherited eye condition in that particular breed. So this this sort of forms the basis of the test. Now I'm going to come on uh, to later 
what animals I think we should be testing. But these 65 breeds are, are ones that it's really important to monitor uh, these diseases in. And like I said, we're going to go through these list of diseases later. So what, what do we do in a routine eye test? It's really designed for adult dogs from um, over six months old. So the litter screen ends at 12 weeks. The routine eye test tends to start from six months old. If you really wanted to get it done earlier, I suppose you could. But um, six months old is a good, a good benchmark to, to aim for. You've got to present that original um, registration certificate, of course, as we already said, and the dog must be microchipped. Again, these animals receive a drop of tropicamide when you first arrive and that dilates the pupil. And then we examine the eye. When you get your certificate uh, filled in uh, by the ophthalmologist, that is valid for 12 months. So who should go for a routine eye test? My own personal view is any dog that's used for breeding should have an eye test. Now, uh, that might not be popular, that might not be universally accepted. Um, owners of breeds of dogs that are not on that list that I popped up a few slides ago may choose not to have a uh, routine eye test, but but I feel that all uh, dogs would benefit from an, from an eye exam before breeding. And it really allows us to pick up any, any problems. Um, and we'll, we'll come on to that um, more later. But this is the certificate that you would get. So we're, I'm just going to go through this in the next few uh, slides in a bit more detail. So the top sec top section up here again is is just uh, your details and your um, pet's details. Then this section here goes through the eye examination findings. So what we've done, exactly which techniques we've used, and then any changes we can we can record on this section. Down here, this inherited eye disease status section, this is where we certify an animal as affected or unaffected for those diseases on that list. And then down here is other diseases that aren't necessarily on the uh, on that known inherited diseases list, but things that we're monitoring. So you might sometimes see a tick in perhaps a dystichiasis box to show that you're a uh, dog has extra eyelashes and it might not necessarily be a, a known inherited disease in that breed but it's something we want to monitor and then the panelists will sign down below so let's let's do a let's um have an example so i've just pulled off the 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 from that table the labrador retriever the labrador retriever we certify for five different conditions so for the kennel club or isds registered dog over here let's pretend we're doing a labrador so um, if I had done an eye test on this Labrador and it was all clear, then I would tick the five diseases that we monitor. And then some panelists will put lines through these unused boxes. Not everybody does, but, but a lot of people do just for neatness and, and to avoid any confusion. Now, if you presented a non-kennel club registered dog, perhaps you have a Labrador that's not registered with a kennel club, or perhaps you've got a Labradoodle, you know, a, a, a breed that... Um, is not the kennel club don't register, then actually the panelist puts a line through that inherited eye disease section, but they will write any findings in this section and they will be able to tick the boxes here. So for example, if a Labradoodle was examined and had a cataract that looked like a hereditary cataract, they would write that there and they could, they could tick this box here, posterior polar subcapsular cataract, which is probably the type it would be. So any any dog can present for the eye test, but you'll get a line through this if it's not on the on that list of known in, inherited ocular diseases. So that's the routine portion of the eye test. What about the glaucoma test or the gonioscopy? We're going to talk more about primary closed angle glaucoma uh, when we get the, to the diseases. But this is one of the most common questions I get. You know, should I have the routine eye test and do I need this gonioscopy? Well, according to our list of diseases, let's have another look. These diseases here that I've highlighted uh, have a G next to them. The G stands for goniodysgenesis or primary glaucoma. And these are the dogs we usually recommend have gonioscopy. We can do gonioscopy in, in any breed, but, it, but it's, it's these ones where it's really important because these ones are the ones with a known uh, inherited uh, uh, predisposition to developing glaucoma. So what is gonioscopy and um, what, why do we do it? So, those 14 breeds of dog known to suffer from primary closed angle glaucoma benefit from gonioscopy. So, for example, the Dandy Dinmont, the Golden Retriever. Um, if you uh, choose to have gonioscopy, it's really important that it's pre 
perform prior to that routine eye test. So I know I talked about the routine eye test first, it's because it's the most common, but actually if we're gonna do gonioscopy, we need to do that first. So we need to do that before the pupils have been dilated to make sure we get an accurate uh, examination of the, of the um, area that, of the eye we're trying to look at. When we do gonioscopy, we use a different eye drop initially. We use a local anesthetic, typically proximetocaine, but it, it, there, there are others out there. Now, once that's applied, that only takes a few seconds to kick in. So it's not like the tropicamide that needs time to soak in to dilate the pupils. The local anesthetic works really rapidly. So we put local anesthetic in, and then very shortly afterwards, we place a gonio lens on the eye. A gonio lens, the, the two types that you'll commonly see examiners using it uh, are this one. This is my favorite. This is called the Cuppy gonio lens, and this is called the Barkan gonio lens, which got a bit of a tube hanging from it and, and you usually attach a little syringe to that to sort of suction it onto the onto the front of the eye. And these kind of work like a special contact lens. They allow you to inspect the iridocorneal angle. The iridocorneal angle in, in the eye is the area where the fluid drains out of the eyeball. Nothing to do with tears and, and draining down the nose. It's the actual fluid within the eyeball. It's constantly produced and it's constantly draining out through the iridocorneal angle. And if we have uh, problems with the iridocorneal angle, if it's not a nice open mesh work, then we can get uh, glaucoma, which is a high pressure in the eye, which is absolutely devastating. Glaucoma is, is usually leads to blindness and it's very painful. So we really, really want to avoid this disease in our, in our, in our pet dogs. Now we give a score for the gonioscopy and I'm gonna talk um, more about the score on the next slide. And once you have a score, that is valid for three years. So remember the routine portion of the eye test is valid for 12 months. The gonioscopy score is valid for three years. Why do we repeat the gonioscopy? Because we know that um, in some breeds it can progress. And we'll talk more about that later, but it doesn't progress rapidly, generally speaking. So every three years seems like a fair compromise of monitoring for progression, but also not um, doing unnecessary testing. So this is the guidance that we that we produce. So we, we give a grade of, zero, one, two, or three. A grade of zero is, is, is really a, a perfect score. There's, there's no abnormalities in the iridocorneal angle or no uh, pectinate ligament abnormality or certainly less than 1%, basically normal. And so of course, with that, with that dog, there's no, um, there's no need to um, have any breeding restrictions with, with a zero. Now with a grade one, this is a very mildly affected dog. So somewhere between one and 25% of that iridocorneal angle that we inspect with the gonial lens has PLA or pectinate ligament abnormality. And I've got some photos of this later to show you. Now, if they're a grade one, actually there's no specific advice. They can, they can breed um, as normal. So a lot of people are a bit upset when they get a grade one, but it's, you know, it, they can, it can be very, very mild. That individual dog is very unlikely to develop, to develop glaucoma with a grade of one and very unlikely to pass any significant risk onto their offspring. When we get to grade two, we need to be cautious. So that's that's between 26 and 75 percent affected. Now, that's a big, broad category, 25, 26 to 75. And we'll talk more about that later. If your dog has a grade two, the advice is to only breed it to a zero or one to be on the safe side. Probably your dog's unlikely to develop um, glaucoma itself. And certainly if you breed it to a zero or one, the chance of passing that on to any offspring is, is also low. When we get up to grade three, this is this is where the iridocorneal angle is now severely affected. So over 75% of the angle is abnormal. And again, I've got some photos to show you of this later. And so actually, if you do get a grade three, it's not really recommended for breeding. Now, with all these things, th these are advice. We we actually don't give set breeding advice as a as a as a panelist we like to direct you back to your breed health coordinator because they've got a really good overview of general breed health um but again we can talk more about that later so if you've if you've gone for gonioscopy the cost approximately doubles so if you have the routine eye test it's currently 63 pounds if you go for the gonioscopy at the same time that's an additional 57 pounds so 120 pounds all in and um some people don't afterwards think that maybe it's not been done because they've only been given one certificate but the gonioscopy we, we use the same certificate we just fill this box in here which i've highlighted in red to show you where you can find that result now far less commonly is is the test for primary closed angle 
glaucoma, sorry, primary open angle glaucoma. There's a typo on that slide, I apologize. And here we use a technique called tonometry. Now this is, we don't do this often because there's only three breeds on our um, known inher inherited ocular disease list that suffer from this open angle glaucoma. What do we do with this? We use a, a, a digital tonometer to measure the pressure. So th this is very uh, rarely done as part of the eye test. And in fact, if, you, if you've got one of these breeds, I'd, I'd recommend when you're booking an eye test to just make sure that whoever's doing the eye testing has one of these instruments with them because they, they, they won't necessarily carry that as a routine. But it's recommended in, in three breeds of dog, the Sharpe, Basset and Petit Basset Griffon Vendine. Um, again, this test is pr performed prior to the routine eye test. Sometimes local anaesthetics used. It depends what type of tonometer. If, you, if, if, if the panelist is using uh, one of these two on the left, they don't require topical anaesthetic. This one does. It doesn't matter. They're, they're all very accurate. Um, and it gives you this digital readout of the intraocular pressure. You know, some of you may have had this done at your opticians. In fact, I have my eyes checked uh, earlier this week and they used one of these uh, on me. So that was that was pretty, pretty good. And then the reading is is also recorded. And, and again, it's all done on the same certificate. This this little area here will be filled in very small. You know, you could miss it if you just glance at your certificate. But this is where you'd record the intraocular pressure. So that's a, that's a, a quick overview of, of the scheme and the different types of test. But what I'd really like to spend some time now is is looking at these hereditary eye diseases that we're picking up. So here's here's just a zoomed in of that sort of um, um, lower section of the form where we tick unaffected or affected. And what I'm going to do now for the next 10 slides or so, 10, 15 slides, is just go over each of these conditions. Um, and I'm going to tell you what they mean, uh, what the disease is and what we look out for, um, which I which I hope will be useful if your um, uh, if your dogs are on that uh, known inherited ocular disease list. OK, so we're just going to uh, go through them as they appear on the form. So we're going to start with collie eye anomaly. And what I've done for all of these diseases is I've just taken from the BVA website the, the collie eye anomaly affected breeds. Now, some of these breeds, for example, the Kelpie, they're not actually on that known inherited ocular disease list, but we do know they're affected for collie eye anomaly. Why is that? It's probably just because they're so um, so uncommon in the UK, very low numbers. Maybe the disease isn't particularly uh, prevalent in the breed. But, you know, if, you, if you've if you got any of the breeds on this list, it's, I'd strongly recommend getting them screened before breeding. But what, what is col collie eye anomaly? It's, it's, a, it's a disease that um, affects the retina, the choroid, which is the blood supply at the back of the eye, and the sclera, which is the white um, sort of tough, uh, outer coat of the eye, and it affects the development of those tissues. So this is all at the back of the eye. This isn't something that you would um, be able to detect or notice at home. There is a high prevalence in some of our breeds. So the rough and smooth collie and, and the Sheltie, Shetland Sheepdog, have, have a high, uh, high prevalence of this disease. There is a DNA test available. Uh, the DNA test is, is, is pretty good at detecting um, a portion of collie eye anomaly um, called choroidal hyperplasia in some breeds very effectively. There's a little bit of um, confusion around the DNA test because in some breeds, um, the, the mutation has not seemed to pick up um, optic nerve head coloboma, which is another uh, one of the sort of spectrum of conditions that can happen with collie eye anomaly. So I think the mutation in this gene is is a really useful DNA test, and, and I'd certainly recommend it, but I don't think it totally replaces eye testing yet. Um, as, as we've said, collie eye anomaly, not usually noticeable to, to you at home, I'm afraid, unless it's really severe, and severe enough to affect vision. So most dogs would have a normal quality of life and apparently normal vision. So why are we why are we bothering to bothering to look for it? Because some have a much more severe disease that, that can actually lead to blindness. So it, it's quite variable that the impact on an, on an individual dog that collie eye anomaly can have. Uh, I don't know if there's any um, collie breeders on, on uh, watching this evening, but there's this phenomenon known as go normal in the in in the uh, collie breeds. And what people mean by go normal is, is that the ability to detect collie eye anomaly is lost as these animals get older. And it doesn't actually mean that they've gone normal. It means that the abnormality is hidden. And I, I've got a picture in a second of that. So um, what is the best way if we want to eradicate 
kan or, or control coliandrin why litter screening because of this go normal phenomenon so there's a couple of I think we've got, I think Ben's frozen there. We'll try and get a hold of him and, and get him back in a minute. If you could just hold the line for one, if you want to hold on the call for a little while. Really nice. Oh, yeah. but ben, you, you, we lost you, you then you for me? about two or three minutes. Oh, where, where did I, where did, where did I lose you? Well, you're on mute, Bill. <laughs> Sorry, you started to talk about go normal. Um, oh yeah, so great! If you could go back to then, that would be great. We do, we we cut you cut out for a little while. Oh no, sorry about that. I'll try. Okay. I'll try to go go normal. Talking about go normal. So go normal is this phenomenon where um, the development of the eye obscures the abnormality. So these dogs don't really go normal. It just means you can't detect the uh, collie eye anomaly. And I, I was just mentioning there's a couple of studies out there which, which have which have proven that if you um, I test at seven week old puppies and then again in in older dogs over three months old actually you'll, you'll probably miss about half of the ones that were abnormal at seven weeks old so it's really important to test these these collies young and and actually I, I like to test them between five and seven weeks old which I know is very young but if we wait till they're pushing 12 weeks we may well miss some of these but Together, you know, litter screening and DNA testing together work really well um, in this disease. So the the, the mutation, in the gene, uh, is really important and will help pick up a lot of disease. But there are just um, certain aspects of the disease that don't seem to always get picked up by the by this mutation. So here's a picture of a of a young puppy, um, really nice age to be presented. I can't remember the exact age, but probably seven eight weeks old, with this large pale patch. This is the classic choroidal hypoplasia that we see. And this is a normal eye up here. It wasn't actually a collie, but just a normal eye. And what happens is, is, is this, this reflective layer in the back of a dog's eye, this it's called the tapetum. This tapetum develops and can obscure this um, abnormality here, which is why it's so important to screen them young. So, you know, this dog could well end up looking like this as an adult, and that will be termed go normal. And of course, it's not, it's not gone normal. It's, it's, the abnormality is hidden. I hope, I hope that makes sense. So mo moving swiftly on um, to retinal dysplasias. And uh, retinal dysplasia, so the retina is the layer of cells at the back of the eye that detects light and allows us and our animals to see. Um, the retinal dysplasia results from an abnormal development of a retina in, in the uterus, so when, when, the, when the dog's a fetus. There's a really wide variation in appearance. And so we have these two conditions that are probably a spectrum, but we've got um, folds, ridges, rosettes, so little folding abnormalities in the in the retina, and then some large, uh, um, what we call geographic, just because they're sort of the shape of countries, you know, kind of random, not like nice circular um, lesions. Um, and we call these multifocal retinal dysplasia or MRD. And then in some breeds, we see this uh, much more dramatic form, which is called total retinal dysplasia. And this is where the retina has either never been attached or detaches at a really young age. Now, the total retinal dysplasia dogs will be blind. But let, let's have a let's just have a, a, a more zoomed in look at MRD and TRD. So MRD, it, it's normally spotted as, as gray streaks, dots and circles. So here's a puppy with MRD. And here's an adult dog with with the typical changes. It can have different appearance. So here's one with um, pigment changes. I'd say that's less common. And then over here, we've got a larger area, which we call geographic retinal dysplasia. Again, probably a little bit less common than these more more simple um, changes. These changes probably develop in 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 the uterus while the um, puppy is developing at about 45 to 50 days of gestation. So litter screening is useful for these so if you ever have a look at that litter screening checklist you'll see that um, breeds like labradors and things are, are on the list for litter screens to look for mrd 
it can sometimes be tricky in young puppies so and subtle changes potentially might be mixed missed and then to, to complicate things in adult dogs the lesions these 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 little areas will remodel over time and so sometimes very small mild lesions might completely disappear again it, it's not really a go normal phenomenon it, it's just a remodeling you know that animal has still got that predisposition to pass on um, multi multifocal retinal dysplasia now why do we care about this actually the majority of dogs really have very little if any sight deficiency but some can be severely visually impaired, which is why we, we want to try and um, breed away from it and avoid breeding from dogs with even mild lesions. The sad thing is, and the difficult thing is for, for, for any breeders here that are listening in, you know, this is probably the more typical MRD um, situation that I'll see. So, you know, one, maybe two, two, three, four, very, very small um, MRD lesions. And for sure this dog is not going to be adversely affected itself its vision is going to be good these shouldn't change um over time they might fade a little bit as the dog gets older but the problem is if if we if we um don't monitor these things and you know say this dog was bred to another dog with with similar lesions we could be building in problems down the line so you know mild mrd is it a problem for the individual dog probably not but we want to make sure we don't develop problems down the line and then total, total retinal dysplasia, obviously a much more severe change. So I'm sure you, you appreciate we wouldn't want to um, be breeding from these dogs and, and these puppies are, are blind from birth. You might even notice a, a sort of whitish appearance behind the pupil if you caught the, the light um, right when you were looking at these animals. And then the, just um, a brief note, there is a second form of, of TRD, to, total retinal dysplasia, associated with, with dwarfism in both the Labrador and Samoyed. Now, these animals look abnormal. You know, they look very short in stature. And there's a, there's a known um, mutation for those, which, which fortunately makes them pretty rare, because I, I think, you know, it's often included in the panel of, of testing for uh, the Labradors and things. So that's the retinal dysplasia. Let's let's move swiftly on to congenital hereditary cataract. And we won't stay long on this because um, actually far more interesting uh, and common is the hereditary cataract. Just as a, just as a you know, what is cataract? Cataract is just any opacity of the lens or its capsule. Now, the only breed affected with congenital hereditary cataract on our on our known infectious uh, inherited ocular disease list is the miniature schnauzer. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's pretty rare. We do litter screens for this in the miniature schnauzer. Um, it's often associated with other eye um, and lens abnormalities, although the cataract itself might not progress. Um, the eye is often uh, can be small. They can have this um, uh, abnormal eye movement that we call nystagmus, sort of searching nystagmus where the eyes sort of don't fix properly. Um, so um, yeah, fortunately, relatively uncommon. We'll come back to the miniature schnauzer when we talk about the hereditary cataract later. So uh, moving swiftly on, persistent hyperplastic primary vitreous, quite a mouthful, abbreviated to PHPV, and this predominantly affects Dobermans and Staffordshire Bull Terriers. This disease is, is a failure of a embryologic blood supply to the lens to regress. So when the puppy's developing in the uterus, it's got a blood supply going to the lens, and that just doesn't disappear as it should normally. You, you might notice something, if you had a litter of pups and they were severely affected, you might notice either visual impairment or a white color to the, the lenses of these puppies when they open their eyes. Similar to a cataract, it can be associated with cataract as well. Um, there's no genetic mutation identified for this and, and the inheritance is complicated, so um, poss possibly will never be or, or, or not nothing on the horizon. And again, a bit tricky because the, the severity can vary so massively. So sometimes these dogs seem totally normal and have no uh, noticeable effect on vision. And, and, other one, and in other cases, they can be completely blind. And that's why, we, that's why we screen for this condition, because obviously it can have a, a very serious effect. Um, and, th and then it can also be associated with other eye conditions. So, for example, if you can see past this, um, this uh, um, big um, um, plaque on the back of the lens to the retina, you might well see things like retinal dysplasia that we just talked about. OK, so now this is going back to um, gonioscopy and glaucoma, but it's listed on the form as PLA, pectinate ligament abnormality. 
So this gets a bit confusing because we there's lots of terms that we use sort of almost interchangeably and they sort of mean subtly different things. So pectinal ligament abnormality is, a, is an indicator of primary closed angle glaucoma and we assess the degree of pectinal ligament abnormality via that gonioscopy technique that that we talked about before when we we're talking about which test you need doing. So um, what we do is, is, is we, we put this gonio lens on the cornea after we've applied that local anesthetic and it allows us to look just here in this little corner between the, the iris and the cornea. So we call this the iridocorneal angle. And what we're looking for is um, any alteration in the fiber type. And I've got some pictures on the next slide, don't worry, because it's a bit of an abstract concept unless you've seen photos. But um, we're looking for any thicker fibers, so abnormal fibers, which we call fibrillate. And if you've ever had a, um, a dog tested for gonioscopy and, and it's been affected, you might see some of these words on the on the on the um, certificate or sheets of uh, tissue, which we call laminae. Now, um, Pectinate ligament abnormality is also called goniodysgenesis. I'm afraid ophthalmologists love to have multiple words for the same thing. It's very confusing. Uh, I'm sorry, there's uh, um, not much we can do about that. But just in case, you know, your ophthalmologist has spoken to you about goniodysgenesis, it's the same as pectinate ligament abnormality. And we know it can progress with time. I'll show you some papers in a, in a bit about that. Again, a complex mode of inheritance, unfortunately, no simple genetic test. So this is what we're looking at when we're looking through the gonio lens. So here's the iris, here's the inside of the cornea, and these beautiful little, very thin little um, uh, little uh, ligaments here are called the pectinate ligaments. So that's lovely and normal. If we saw that, we'd be really, um, we'd be really happy. And then here's a series of photos showing um, progressive worsening. So here's pretty, pretty much normal. Perhaps you know some slightly thickened little ligaments here, but pretty normal, pretty open. And then when we get to here, we start to get these thicker um, areas of um, ligament. And when we get to here, we can see these are starting to form sheets. And suddenly there's a lot less open areas. And this, these open areas are where the fluid from inside the eye has to flow to drain out to maintain normal pressure inside the eye. And then when we start to get really advanced pectinate ligament abnormality, we start to get these um, really wide sheets obstructing this lovely normal drainage angle here with really just a few very um, uh, small areas of, of normal pectinate ligament. And then when it gets really extreme, um, there's really just little flow holes here. You know, and, and so this dog is really at risk of developing glaucoma. So the, these, this is what we have to look at and assess when we when we give that score. Um, and it, I, again, just a, a, another couple of slides on gonioscopy later, it's worth getting back to. But let's move swiftly on through our list of diseases to hereditary cataract. So hereditary cataract is, is present in many breeds, as, as you can see here. Um, the, the problem is, and I, I'm, I'm not going to go into every breed, I, I promise, but that it's really breed dependent on the age that it appears, how they appear, and then the development or, or progression of the hereditary cataract. The majority are small and non-progressive with minimal effect on vision. So again, why are we? Why do we care then? Why are we identifying this? Because they can progress to complete blindness in some cases. Um, again, I'm afraid complex inheritance, so no easy DNA test to rule it out. So here's a dog that I saw um, for a routine eye test. This is a Labrador. And you can just see those little triangular um, spots back there, right at the back of the lens. Now, they're really difficult to see with the naked eye um, because they're right at the back of the lens. But when the pupil's dilated, you can just see these little triangles there. And in many dogs, that will be all there is. But we just had a case in work the other day. Um, this, this was a Labrador. It had a little um, hereditary cataract and it started to spread look. And this was in April and then it came in to see us two weeks ago and it had a total cataract. And this eye was really sore and inflamed because of this cataract. So whilst most of them um, are fairly innocent, they certainly can progress. And this is why we don't want to be um, breeding dogs with, with hereditary cataract. Primary lens luxation. This is um, uh, a inherited defect in the, the ligaments, also known as the zonule that holds a lens in place inside the eye. Really typical in the terrier breeds, but also a few um, sort of slightly odd breeds not really related to, to terriers at all, like the Border Collie. Um, 
we get a progressive progressive degeneration of this zonule or these ligaments that hold the, the lens in place. So when these animals are born, their eye probably looks totally normal. And as they get older, um, these ligaments break down, the lens starts to become loose within the eye. This is one of the true sort of genuine opth ophthalmic emergencies if an animal suffers from a, a, a lens luxation um, because it can um, come into the front of the eye and, and cause a glaucoma, which is painful and will, will result in blindness. This is a really great success story in terms of the genetic mutation. So in, in many of the terrier breeds, the genetic mutation is known, it's widely available. And I, even during my training um, in the uh, sort of late 20, uh, what, sort of 2010, we used to see this a reasonable amount. And now, thank goodness, we see far less of it, I think because of the success of the DNA test. Um, if, if a dog is affected, if it's got two faulty copies of the gene, they tend to get a lens luxation at about five years old, um, but if they're carriers, then they can get a lens luxation much later in life, around 10 years old or so. What can you notice at home? Well, when the lens becomes unstable, you notice the lens kind of slips down in the eye. So this is an older dog. The lens has got a kind of grayish appearance just with, due to age, but that's the pupil. That's the edge of the pupil. That's the top of the lens. You shouldn't be able to see that. that the lens should be really nicely centered in the eye. And so we've got this gap here. This is one of the key things we look for when we're examining these dogs. Um, what can it look like if they get if the lens comes into the front of the eye? This is the genuine emergency. They can look odd. You know, you, you wouldn't necessarily know what was going on just looking at this dog, but you, you probably tell something was unusual with its eye. And when you look closer, you know, this is the lens and it's completely moved into the front chamber, what we call the anterior chamber of the eye. And, and this has to be removed really quickly. Otherwise, um, this eye is going to go blind. Um, it's going to cause a lot of damage. It's sometimes a bit easier to see if the if the lens has also got cataract like like this. This this lens has actually fallen completely backwards within the eye. Actually, it does less damage if it falls backwards, whereas in its other eye it had come forwards, and this is why it had come in to, to see us because this was an, what we call an anterior or forwards luxation. This was a posterior or backwards luxation, and the lens can move between being in the front and in the back. So that's primary lens luxation. Fortunately, um, a bit less. Um, we don't see it as much as we used to. So primary open angle glaucoma. So this is the this is the other type of glaucoma, but much less common actually. And and the breeds that we tend to see in the UK are, are listed here. So if you if you've not got one of these breeds, um, then uh, then then hopefully very unlikely to see this disease. It's quite difficult to diagnose because unlike the primary closed angle glaucoma, we can't do that gonioscopy test to look for like risk factors. We really only identify this when the pressure starts to increase. And, and actually what we've got here is, is we've got luxated lenses. So similar to the last case I just spoke to you about, but what's happened here is that eyeball, the pressure goes up very slowly and the eyeball stretches and those little fibers that hold the lens in place start breaking down not because of, a, a, of, a, of an inherited problem with the fibres like in the terriers, but because the eyeball enlarges and stretches and the lens um, starts to break free. There are genetic tests for some of these, um, some of these breeds, and so they can be quite useful. This is, this is a biggie, PRA or progressive retinal atrophy. You can see all the, all the breeds here. Now, it, it, it's not actually one specific disease. It's, it's a term for a broad range of inherited retinal diseases. Um, and, uh, but they all have a common endpoint, which unfortunately is blindness with atrophy or, or wasting of the, of the retina. And so what will you tend to notice? It's usually a loss of um, night vision followed by a loss of day vision happening over sort of months to years. It doesn't tend to happen quickly. I'm afraid there's, there's no treatment for it. Um, and genetic mutations have been identified for many, but not all types of PRA. So, for example, if you've if you've got golden retrievers, there's three um, commonly uh, tested for variants of PRA. But there are some that that are not picked up by the genetic testing, which is why that eye testing continues to be important. Now, it can be tricky to pick this up here on the left. We've got um a, a really advanced uh, retinal atrophy case, progressive retinal atrophy case with no blood vessels. And it's got a really bright, shiny appearance. Compare that to the normal eye here on the right. And you, you, can, you can see the difference there. But what's different, what's difficult is the sort of um, the 
variation. So, you know, in the early stages of PRA, you just get a slight thinning of these blood vessels and it can be quite tricky to pick up. So in a lot of breeds, we only start to really accurately pick this up five, six, seven years old. You know, perhaps after the breeding days are, are gone of these um, of these patients. OK, last last but uh, not least, retinal pigment epithelial dystrophy or RPED. Now, this used to be called central progressive retinal atrophy. So in a lot of the older textbooks and things, it might still you might still see it referred to as that. And here are the breeds we, we look for in the UK. It's another degenerative condition of the retina, um, but it affects um, a, a very specific layer in the retina called the RPE or retinal pigment epithelium. What that RPE does is it's really important in the kind of recycling and, and maintenance of a healthy retina. So um, when, when our eyes detect light, they use photopigments. Those are the special chemicals that, that detect the light waves. And those photopigments are used up and then the RPE recycles them. And if the RPE isn't, um, isn't working properly, it leads to accumulations of these um, degenerated photopigments, which can damage the cells in a, in a, in a kind of a nutshell. Um, it's variable age and onset. We don't see it uh, that often, certainly not as common as PRA in my experience. And the interesting thing is it's linked to vitamin E deficiencies or metabolic issues in some of the breeds. And there's probably not time to go into that. We could probably talk about uh, that itself for an hour or so. Um, but the peripheral vision might be spared in these animals. So, so like unlike the PRA, which always progresses to, to, to blindness, in RPD, these dogs might, um, uh, you might notice that they happy to work in um, in dimmer light, but in bright light, they don't they don't like it because they can't see very well. It's got a complex inheritance and also gen um, dietary factors have an effect. So, for example, if these cases are detected early and they get vitamin E supplementation, then that can often be enough to um, to uh, help these animals maintain the, the level of vision that they've got. So here's here's um, some pictures from the textbook of, of RPD, pretty pretty dra dramatic. Here's the, here's our normal again, just for comparison. And then here's a case that I saw recently. So you know people always pick the best pictures for the textbook. Actually, it can be a whole lot more subtle. So here, you know, this case we initially thought had a PRA because it had this atrophy of its blood vessels, a kind of bright shiny appearance, which is implying atrophy, but just these few little specks of, of pigment. And actually when we tested it, it did have low vitamin E. So actually that dog had had RPED. OK, so that appreciate really quick run through, but um, we, we, we've, we've only got uh, uh, an hour. So what other eye diseases do we identify? So, so these diseases here are not on the known inherited ocular um, uh, disease list for, for hereditary eye disease. But these are the things that you might notice in the comments section. So we'll look at eyelid issues. We'll look at corneal disease, sometimes iris issues, um, other other lens issues that, that aren't um, hereditary cataract, the vitreous, that's the jelly in the back of the eye. And then we'll sometimes see retinal issues. So that's the, the nerve fiber layer at the very back of the eye there. So we might make notes on any of these things on the certificate, but we don't or we're not certain that they're hereditary, or if they are hereditary, it might be very complicated modes of inheritance. So this is other things we might note on the form. I'm afraid we just don't have time to go into each of these. But also I thought what was just important to, to say is that with the, with the eye screening, you know, we're, we're not doing a complete eye exam like you would get if you went to your vet or, or certainly referred to a veterinary ophthalmologist. So I just thought it'd be useful to let you know, you know, we don't do a thorough assessment of the eye before we've dilated the pupil. We don't use, you know, the orange dye that many of you will have seen that's called fluorescein. We, we don't use fluorescein staining during the eye test. We don't measure the tear production with a Shermer tear test. We don't tend to measure the intraocular pressure unless it's one of those very specific breeds. And we don't do things like looking at the nasal aquinal system, the drainage system of the of the eye. So remember with this scheme, we're really looking at hereditary eye disease, not all eye disease. Whilst we may, might make a comment on it, you know, this this is really designed as a pre-breeding check. So if your pet's got an ulcer or conjunctivitis, well, that's very unlikely to be hereditary. It might be really annoying and it might be a significant problem for your pet that, that certainly needs veterinary care. But it, it's from, from a purely hereditary point of view, it's not something that we would worry about. Um, I hope I hope that makes sense. 
So that's, you know, whistle stop th tour through the diseases. What, what, why is it important to continue testing? So, you know, in breeding animals, we recommend examination every 12 months. And a lot of people might get fed up of that. You know, they get a clear certificate at one, two years old and they think, well, you know, do I really need to, to get this done? So why do we recommend you keep coming back? Well, that's because many diseases do develop as an animal gets older. So the recommendation is um, we've, we've tried to move away from saying you must have an annual eye test. But instead, we say that you should have had an eye test within 12 months of breeding. So, you know, if you're going to take a litter at two years old, get an eye test done at 18 months, two years. And then if you're not going to take another litter for a couple of years, well, then fine. But make sure you get another eye test before you um, before you organize um, the next breeding session, if that makes sense. So have a valid certificate um, at, at the time of breeding um, to pick up some of those diseases that might develop as, as the animal gets older. And remember that just because um, a disease isn't on that on that list, new diseases emerge all the time. We've got um, we, we might get to a couple of examples of those. And then um, if you, if you look really into all the data, a lot of diseases actually have been reported in in certain breeds, but because they're at a really low prevalence, we're, we're not marking them as affected or unaffected for that. We, we have this kind of 1% prevalence rate where if it's below that, we, te we take them off that that list because it, it's not a um, it's not a big enough concern for for really concerted effort to look at that disease. Um, but also there's no genetic test for many of the diseases that we that we examine so examine for so it's it's really important to keep coming back and it's and ideally it would be really important to come back when animals get to about 8 years old because although their breeding days are probably done that's how you really pick up these later onset inherited diseases so um for example, going back to the golden retriever, you know, we've got three known mutations for the PRA in the golden retriever, um, PRCD, and then golden retriever PRA1 and golden retriever PRA2. But we still see PRA in the golden retriever, even though they're negative for those three mutations, those three genetic tests. Why is that? Because sporadically, some other form of PRA will develop in a breed. And so it, it it's um the 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 genetics and, and and things is not the whole story we need the we need to keep doing the eye exams and so i just wanted to put one or two slides about genetic testing because actually genetic testing is fantastic and it works hand in hand with the eye testing so i i, I you know we need people far cleverer than me to come and talk to you properly about genetic testing um but, but very basically, what the genetic testing does is it looks at the what's known as the genotype. So that's the actual genetic sequence, the genetic code of those animals. What are we doing in the eye test? We're looking at what's called the phenotype of an individual, and that is the outwards manifestation or expression of the of the genetic code in that animal. So, for example, we can look at a golden retriever with PRA, and we can say, right, the phenotype of this animal is PRA, but I can't tell you which of the three common mutations it has we need the genetic testing for that um, so they, they they work hand in hand um, what genetic testing can do though which is really cool is it can detect carriers in a lot of these these diseases which of course the eye testing can't so you know you, we really need them both working together um, the simple inherited diseases are caused by a single um, gene mutation and these are you know the the, the, the kennel club genetic center run by Catherine Mellash, Mellash that was at the Animal Health Trust for years and then is now at Cambridge University, has has really done amazing work in this area over the last 20 years or, or more, finding these gene mutations. You know, Catherine and her team are, are really, really good at this. And because of her and, and collaborators around the world, of course, but, you know, we've got genetic tests for many of these diseases. Where it becomes tricky is complex inherited diseases because there's no one mutation. It's the additive effect of many different genes. So for example, the pectinate ligament abnormality and probably the hereditary cataract, th there's no one mutation that causes that, but it's probably the combination of all the genes from the mum and the dad coming together to form disease in that individual. Think of height in people. You know, there's not like a tall gene and a short gene. There's, a, there's an interaction of loads of different genes plus environmental factors that, that lead to your final height. 
Um, but the list of mutations is growing and I'd really encourage you to check out um, this website. Um, uh, and if you, I'll, I'll just go to a screenshot of the website. You can type in the breed here and it will um, tell you what known mutations there are and tell you all about it. It's quite scientific, but it's, it's a really good source of information. Um, so I just wanted to spend uh, a, a few minutes uh, talking about some of the controversies. Maybe it's too strong a word, but to do with the test. You know, we, we, no, no panelist would would um, say that the eye test is perfect. But if we look at the principles of health screening, and this is according to an old um, an old couple of authors from from the 60s from the World Health Organization, you know, they said that screening needs, needs to be based on a reliable but not necessarily perfect test, reach as large a proportion of the breeding population as possible. And that's where we need to really work together to, to, to eye test as many breeding dogs as possible, um, be easy to perform repeatedly, be economically viable, and to detect affected individuals as early as possible. So on these criteria, I think the eye test is pretty good. I, I Like I say, I would like to reach more population, but I, but I think it's pretty good. So, but what? But why do we have these con controversies? Why do people get fed up with eye testing? Well, as we've already said, some diseases only appear later in life after breeding has ended. So, you know, the worst case scenario is a is a is a stud dog that's sired however many litters, and then it develops a cataract or PRA at eight nine years old. You know that that that's bad. That's spread a lot of um, uh, bad genes throughout the population. What I think is 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 difficult for us as 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 eye panelists is that we know that some non-inherited diseases can mimic inherited diseases. So, for example, uh, a viral infection of the of the uh, the dam could affect the puppies as they're developing in uterus, and they could have um, changes in their retina that look like multifocal retinal dysplasia. And then we mark that animal down as being affected for multifocal retinal dysplasia, and withdraw it from the breeding pool. When it when or advise it's removed from the breeding pool when it's it's actually was was not an inherited multifocal retinal dysplasia, and there's um you know unfortunately there's nothing we can do about that we we always would try and give um uh, dogs the benefit of the doubt if possible but if it's a characteristic appearance then we would mark it down as affected, and we know that sometimes we might be marking down dogs as affected when it's not truly inherited but rather something that's affected that individual dog. And, and that's a limitation of the testing. Um, we've already said complex genetic uh, and environmental factors um, are, are present for some disease like hereditary cataracts. So, you know, for example, a family can be, you know, several generations clear of hereditary cataract and then one litter has one or more affected dogs and that's really difficult for, for people to um to take and understand and I, you know you totally have my sympathy and unfortunately it's it's due to the complex nature of the genetics in in a lot of cases and then just a, just a brief um final word on gonioscopy i'm wrapping up i promise as always um, i always talk a bit too much um on gonioscopy because i know some um some breed societies are not particularly um happy with with um, having to undergo gonioscopy. I mean, I think so gonioscopy is, it, you know, it's an indicator of a risk of development of glaucoma. So so lots of people will say, well, you know, I, I had a, a, a grade three dog and it never developed glaucoma. F for sure, that can that can definitely happen. But but that dog is definitely at a higher risk of developing glaucoma. And when we see clinical glaucoma cases come into the to the, the being referred, they 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 will have grade three angles. So whilst having a grade three doesn't necessarily mean that you'll get glaucoma, if you've if you've got glaucoma, you'll have a grade three angle in the in the breeds where it's a primary closed angle glaucoma. Um, and we know you know there's some old studies, well oldish now from the 90s that that looked at the risk you know associating gonioscopy scores with glaucoma only in the flat coat retriever is the only paper I've read, but that that did show a um, an association. Um, historically, so um, only, only five, six years ago or so, gonioscopy was deemed a once in a lifetime test. So you went along, you got your gonioscopy and, and you were given either unaffected or affected. And it used to be the unaffected ones were less than 25% abnormal 
in the uh, pectinate ligament abnormality and affected ones were greater than 25 percent and then a couple of papers came out um, that that actually looked at um, uh, flat coats in one paper and then Welsh Springer Spaniels in another paper and they showed that um, in the flat coats 40 percent of dogs had progression of the pectinate ligament um, abnormality it was called pectinate ligament dysplasia then this is typical thing that ophthalmologists do I'm sorry but so 40 percent of flat coats um, progressed and um, uh, 53 percent of the Welsh Springers progressed so so because of that we know that we shouldn't just do it as a one once in a lifetime test we know it's going to progress um, as they get older and it's really important to have that data to, to find out wh where these animals end up so now we give a grade I think it's better I think it's 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 probably not totally perfect we've got these really wide categories and they were developed to try to maximize agreement between examiners but you know I'll be the first to admit it is still a subjective test you know you have to try and estimate how much of this iridocorneal angle is affected and, and it's and it's tricky it's definitely easier in some breeds so a little dandy dinmont or um or cocker spaniel that sits there looking up at you is is dead easy uh, you know very very difficult to um uh have it have any concerns there in larger dogs with deep set eyes very powerful eyelids very active third eyelids so typically golden retrievers flat coat retrievers it it can be really challenging and anybody that's got those breeds and got experience of having gonioscopy done will probably be able to tell you about you know the examiner that took five goes trying to get the lens in and the lens kept falling out and you know it, it, it is challenging so I just wanted to show you this because this is where our, I think the way we do it in the UK um, is is better than than how they do it in mainland Europe if, I, if I'm honest I think our grading scheme is fairer and works better and this was work done by um, James Oliver when when they were trying to figure out how to account for this um, subjectivity between examiners so they examined almost 100 eyes two very experienced examiners um, and they they had to try and estimate the percentage affected which is really tricky try and estimate to the nearest five percent so this is what they tried to do and then they each examiner independently examined the same animal and and these lines uh show the difference between their scores so down here at the bottom when they're low grade you know under 25 percent, there's really good agreement you know there is some differences and then it obviously gets a bit harder up here you know one one exam I mean, this is the most extreme example one examiner thought it was 75 percent affected one thought only 25 percent affected you know so that that's i think that's the biggest difference in the paper so this was sort of not quite experiment well you know in a, in a testing setting and you know we should we are slowly but surely collecting data on dogs that we do gonioscopy in and and really importantly have repeat gonioscopy measurements in and you know hopefully we'll be able to see how well this does but but first impressions from early data is that actually in the real world there actually seems to be even better agreement um, than, than these two examiners in this sort of experimental paper so anyway that's 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 gonioscopy um, for you and I just wanted to to finish by saying you know if you do um, go for a, a hereditary eye disease screening test and and you're not happy with the result maybe you know your animals be marked as affected or maybe it's it's got a high gonioscopy score you're really encouraged to to appeal if you're not happy with that result and I, so i just wanted to make you all aware that appeals are, are, are very you know totally just part of the normal work but just to make you aware that you've got to lodge the appeal with the bva within 30 days it says in writing all sounds very formal but of course these days you can just send an email um, and then what happens is if you go for an appeal, the BVA will organise a second examiner to perform the eye test again. If the second examiner agrees with the first examiner, then the decision is upheld. If, this, if the second examiner disagrees, then the dog needs to be examined by the chief panellist, which, which can be a bit of a, a faff because you've often got to travel to the chief panellist. But then the decision of the chief panellist is final. So it's it's just to let you know that that, that is there. So I think I've spoken for slightly longer than I wanted to. I hope I hope you'll excuse me. I hope you uh, found it interesting. And um, just uh, thank you very much for listening. And um, the BVA have just given us this last slide where you can scan this QR code and fill in uh, your details if you want to um, um, uh, stay up to date with them.
Ben, thank you so much for that. It really was interesting. I could have listened to you for all night, but we have only got limited time. <laughs> I have got a few questions. So thank you so much. So if you could, if I could just ask you some some of the questions that have come through, and some of them have been pre-submitted. Um, the first one is, why is the ECVO test not used in the same way as it is in Europe? And I think you probably better start off by saying exactly what ECVO stands for. Yeah. Thanks, Bill. So, so ECVO is a uh, European College of Veterinary Ophthalmologists. So, I am a um, that's my uh, sort of certifying body. I'm a, I'm a diplomat of the European College of Veterinary Ophthalmologists. A lot of the eye panelists are, and they have a similar scheme. And if anybody on on this call used to go to the Animal Health Trust for eye testing, you know that for years that was the um, that was the scheme they used at, at the Animal Health Trust. Now, if we do the ECVO scheme, it, it, uh, the Kennel Club will, will accept those results and can um, they can be added to the um, system. There's a bit of uh, sort of uh, traditional, uh, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, just sort of a hist history here where this eye testing this eye testing scheme, the BVA Kennel Club ISDS scheme, predates the ECVO schemes. So I think for a long, you know, we've had a good testing scheme in the UK for many, many years. Most of our mainland European colleagues have, have gone over to the ECVO scheme. Perhaps their national schemes w weren't as good as ours, or perhaps they just wanted more uniformity and conformity. The end result is very similar. Um, the, the ECVO scheme is a little bit more harsh, so they don't have... Um, a list of um, diseases as such for each breed, rather anything you spot in the eye is is sort of taken on its own merit. So you, you so for, for example, say you had, um, I, don't, I don't know, say, say you were looking at a Westie, you know, a West Highland White Terrier is not even on our list. Say, say you were examining a West Highland White Terrier and you found it had a cataract then then that may well be marked down as affected and, and, and recommended not to breed. Whereas in the UK, we would say, well, you know what, like there's no evidence that cataract is a, is a is an issue in the West Highland White. So we give this dog the benefit of the doubt that this isn't a hereditary disease. Now, you can argue the rights and wrongs of that. You know, I think so the, the British scheme, a little bit more lenient, perhaps at the risk of, of maybe missing new and emerging diseases in the early stage. But also what, what I think the Europeans have a big problem is, is especially with the numerically small breeds, they're very quick to rule things out of breeding. And so that's got its own problems. So it's, so it's pros and cons. If, if, you, if, you, if you specifically wanted the ECVO scheme, there are people in the UK that, that do it. Um, okay. If that, yeah. That's, that's fine, Ben. This, this question almost leads on from that one, actually. Um, unless the condition is listed as hereditary, the results are not published. How do we know what conditions are being found in a breed? And is it possible to notify the breed health coordinators about comments made on certificates if a condition is found to be occurring? Yeah, re really nice question as well. So what what the Kennel Club or the, the BVA with the Kennel Club are, are, are trying to do here is, is if there's um, significant disease found but that it isn't on the list you're absolutely right it doesn't get expressly put on the kennel club website but what they're trying to do now is is, is add a comment on the health finder that says observation made refer to certificate and and that might well be something totally benign an extra eyelash that is really no concern to anybody or it could be you know that there's a there's a there's a a cataract that looks like it might be hereditary so you you're right the, the the onus is then sort of on the on the breeder to to talk to the, the 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 breeding partner and have a look at the certificate themselves and and then liaise with the breed health coordinator about whether that might be significant or not and um uh the breed health coordinators what what we do every year is we gather up all of the eye testing certificates that have been done and um it's looked at by a by a panel of um, of, of, of experts on the eye panel um, called the sightings committee. I'm, I'm not a member of that, but they sit down for several days in BVA headquarters and they compile lists of, of diseases and anything that looks like it's emerging, you know, cropping up frequently in, in, in one breed or another, then, then action will be taken. So hopefully, so I hope if, if that question's come from a breed health coordinator, you know, communication is, is key, but but it should happen that you are notified if there seems to be a, a, a new or emerging disease in, in your particular breed.
that's that great advice. There, yeah. It does, yeah, that's great advice, Ben. I think that's with any any condition, it always tell the breed health, health coordinators because we're always collecting data and information. Um, one question about late onset conditions. Um, annual te eye testing does not always prevent affected bitches from being bred from. Why is there not more of a push to develop DNA tests for these conditions? Yeah, I I, I, sh I sort of share your frustration. You think, you know, these, these diseases have been around for generations. Why have we not um, found them out yet? Those late onset diseases are a challenge and especially those complex um, trait diseases where there's not a simple mutation, really difficult to find. So the genetic testing needs a lot of data, both from eye tests and genetic data from animals, and it needs a lot of investment to, to look for um, genetic mutations, and then they often don't find any. What I what I would say is here, I mean, it's it's a it's a really good question. Even more importantly, might be um, uh, the sire rather than the, rather than the bitch. You know, a bitch in its lifetime is going to have maximum a handful of litters, whereas a, a sire obviously could could father many many litters. And here, you know, we what we really encourage people to do is 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 actually come in for eye testing in older animals, so those animals over about eight years old. And actually, so probably the best thing we can do here is, is encourage testing of older animals, which it it's not it's not got a good take up in, in the UK. And I totally get that. You know, the dog's retired, it's just a pet. Why would I spend 50 quid or 60 quid or whatever it is on getting it eye tested when it's not gonna do anything? And you and you're right, for your individual dog, it doesn't do anything. It, it's for that for the general good of the breed but it's it, it, i can understand why people don't do it but that that would be that would be where i would push you know let's examine older dogs and pick up those diseases of course it's too late for their offspring but we can then follow the offspring of their offspring and, and try and eradicate it that way but yeah re, that's a really nice question again but i hope that yeah. helps that i think eye testing rather than dna testing is probably the way there I think the former chief panelist, Sheila Crispin, she would echo those words. She was always banging on about uh, testing older dogs. Yeah, um, it's a quite a simple question here. Will glaucoma generally affect both eyes? Yes, unfortunately. If it's if it's okay. primary glaucoma, it, it it's very, very sad. It will in almost inevitably affect both eyes and both eyes will go blind. It's a it's a really depressing disease. OK, um, so, uh, is, I think you've touched on this for me. Just a little bit more explanation, perhaps. Please can you explain more about MRD. I have known dogs have had an eye check and been told they have MRD. Sometimes quite a num large number of folds, one or two later, they're rechecked and they they don't have them. How is it possible? And how can they be? How how can you have confidence that they're going to be clear one year, not the next? Yeah, I think uh, it's. I th yeah, I think I'd, I might have touched on that during when I was talking about MRD. There's a there's a few different possible explanations i think you know if they if uh, without knowing the specifics is difficult i think sometimes where if they're detected as young puppies on a litter screen it's almost like the the eyeball it's almost like the retina is too big to fit inside the eyeball and so sometimes you pick them up on a litter screen and then when you see them at one year 18 months old the retina is kind of smoothed out and and they're no longer detectable uh, that doesn't happen that often because we don't get that many for litter screening but i think probably what what has happened in this person's question they're probably being detected at one year old two years old and then maybe they've got another eye test three four five and and they've not been there and and that is because of this remodeling you know they they fade and so unfortunately those early tests will have been the more accurate ones and and you know like some people use the term go normal for these as well it only tends to happen if they're mild. So although there might have been multiple folds, I bet I, I bet they were very mild ones. And um, yeah, it's it's some it's just something that happens. I mean, like I say, unfortunately, the earlier tests were the most accurate, and it's 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 faded from view rather than you know it's not like that dog doesn't have the risk of passing that on um, to its offspring. Ben, thank you so much for that. We have come the, to the end of the time now. So thank you so much. I think there's a very good chance we might revisit this and ask you back sometime in the future because I think some of these conditions you could probably spend a whole hour on on it in itself. So thank you, thank you once again. Um, I hope everyone's enjoyed the webinar tonight on this really important topic. More information about the BVA KCIDS scheme, can, I scheme can be found on the Kennel Club or the BVA's websites. We have recorded this webinar. 
It will be available on the Kill Club's YouTube channel shortly. And we'll send you a, all, all a link along to this with a short feedback. And I would like to ask you to please feed that, uh, fill that uh, feedback in and send it back to us because it's really important. We know your views on, on, the, on these webinars. Um, you can also access all our webinars um, or via YouTube with all, all sorts of topics we've touched on, including BOAS and, and uh, other uh, IVVD, uh, IVDD, rather, spinal problems, osteosarcoma, epilepsy, DNA testing and much more. And please do feel free to email the health team at the Kennel Club. The email address is health at thekennelclub.org.uk with any comments or feedback. So. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. We look forward to seeing you again in the future. Thank you and goodbye.